Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Approaching Data Management Technology, sponsored today by Alexio and Infodix. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper in the bottom middle for that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording, and we'll likewise send a link to the recording of this session as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Dipti for a word from our sponsor, Alexio. Dipti, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon, and hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here today. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. And let me know if you can see it. Looks great. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Um, hello, everyone. I'm here to talk a little bit about Aluxio. Uh, Aluxio is a unified data orchestration layer for the cloud. Um, uh, what exactly does this mean? Um, to, in today's world, we're seeing four big trends that are driving the need uh, to think about a new architecture. And Peter will talk about you know, how important architecture is later on uh, in today's session. What we're seeing is um, a separation of compute and storage uh, becoming increasingly important as uh, folks move, enterprises move to a hybrid and multi-cloud environment, uh, as well as new storage technologies like object stores in the cloud, as well as on-premise becoming more important. Um, all of this is driving for self-service data and a data-driven culture across enterprises. And with these four trends, we're seeing that um, an ecosystem that was very simple uh, many years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, that started off with one compute and one storage system, that is Hadoop Map produced as a compute layer and Hadoop HDFS as a storage layer, has become quite complex in today's world because of these four trends. Uh, in this environment, uh, we're seeing a lot more compute frameworks, and there's more that will keep coming up um, as, uh, as the ecosystem evolves. And there will be more storage systems that, that keep developing as well, from NFS to HDFS um, to increasingly object storage. In this complicated uh, environment, uh, it's becoming expensive, um, complex, and uh, 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 and uh, uh, performance is starting to get affected for data-driven workloads. And what enterprises are seeing is uh, a need for a new layer across, um, in the, in the, right in the middle of the stack, between compute as well as storage, to enable independent scaling of, uh, of these layers. And that's what Aluxio is. Aluxio is a data orchestration layer that helps you scale out your compute frameworks and burst in the cloud or burst in on-premise independently of your storage tier underneath, um, which might be a range of different storage systems which have evolved over the years. And so with this new data orchestration layer, um, you can achieve better data locality, uh, better accessibility for your data, which may be spread across different data silos, as well as uh, better elasticity for your data, um, increasingly as compute is, needs to be more and more um, elastic. So let's take a look at what are the use cases that uh, the separation and the data orchestration enables. The first one is uh, being able to have better performance as well as better accessibility um, in, in a single cloud, and in, in this case, the example here shows Spark that's running on S3 or other frameworks, other big data frameworks that might be running on S3. With a data orchestration layer in the middle, you can run, you can bring your data very close to your compute in the same environment even um, as, uh, as your compute and it accelerate your performance. 
You can also take existing deployments uh, like HDFS that might be on-premise and enable compute in a hybrid in environment with Hive or Spark or Presto running in the cloud with HDFS instances on-premise. And you can also enable much more complex environments, including running big data on object stores, uh, which might be on-premise or in the cloud. Uh, which Aluxio and data orchestration enables as well. So this, these, um, these use cases are enabled by a few key innovations. Uh, Aluxio includes a unified namespace, which makes it easy to address all your data silos that might be spread across different storage systems. It includes APIs for different, um, different types of frameworks. Uh, for example, uh, for a HDFS integrations, S3 integration, um, a POSIX integration as well, so that the same data can be exposed in many different ways to different um, frameworks. And it enables um, data locality with caching uh, and multi-tiering, uh, which includes having data in memory, in SSDs, or disk, close to the computer as possible. And so that, in a nutshell, is Aluxio and what Aluxio enables. Aluxio is an open source project um, and with great momentum. I invite you to uh, try us out and uh, join the conversation on our Slack channel at aluxio.org slash Slack. Back to you, Shannon. Dipti, thank you so much for this great uh, presentation and sponsorship. And if you have questions for Dipti, she will be joining us in the uh, Q&A portion of the webinar at the end. Now let me turn the presentation over to Cam from our second sponsor today, Infojix. Cam, hello and welcome. Hey, thanks, Shannon. Really appreciate it. Hello to everyone out there. Uh, I, I think, you know, one of the things that makes uh, us so excited to be a part of this data education series and, and this webinar today that Peter is going to take us through is really is looking at asking the question of why is it that some data management organizations are successful while others fail? And I think like most success stories, there are common patterns and trends of high performing organizations. Um, as you all can see from, from the slide, Infogix has been around for a long time, and we've helped build hundreds of data programs over the years, many of you who are on the phone here today. And there's been a lot of research behind this. I think based on external research and even our internal findings, there, there actually are some specifics that really are the common patterns of why some organizations succeed and why others fail. One of the biggest ones is that um, most successful data management programs, in fact, 85%, measure the impact that that program has on critical business objectives. So 85% of the successful programs do some sort of measurement on the impact to how that program is delivering some value to the business. And how do they do that? Well, typically data impacts a business in three predominant ways. Typically data as it gets used for analytics and insights, how it gets used for operational purposes, such as within business processes, or how it's used to reduce risk from a compliance and regulatory standpoint. And what we do at Infogix is we look at what data is critical to driving those business objectives out of those key areas. And typically it gets down to about one to 2% of your data overall. So if you think about the vast amount of data that you have in your organization, what that means is that one to 2% really drive about 90% of the outcomes. And what we, what we do is we provide essentially services and solutions that help uh, our, our customers build a strategy and a roadmap that builds competencies around that philosophy and it looks at how the people, process, and technology need to best serve the critical data that, that drives those outcomes. Um, we then tie those competencies to solutions that measure the business value and the ROI itself. And our solutions are specifically in the areas of data preparation, data quality, data management, and data governance. So on the converse side of that, why do some companies fail? I think one of the interesting things that Peter will get into is that there are some patterns there as well, and there are some, some pitfalls that I'm sure lessons learned, some of you on the phone who have been bloodied through the wall in, uh, in, in, in lessons learned in the past, but also from, um, from our experience as well, 
companies that tend to look for technology as a silver bullet, instead of accounting for the people and the personas who, are, who will benefit from the, uh, those technologies, tends to be a misstep. Also organizations that don't essentially look at the tool strategy in a way that it addresses the core business objectives and needs, that tends to be a misstep. In organizations that think with a project focus instead of a program focus tends to be a misstep as well. And I think those are all really exciting ideas that, um, that Peter is going to unpack here as a part of, uh, of the conversation that we're really excited about. So thank you again for taking the time to listen. We're really um, proud to be a sponsor and a part of today's conversation. And uh, Shannon, at this point, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Cam, thank you so much. And again, um, Cam will also be available in the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end if you have any questions for him. So let me turn, introduce to you then for our speaker for today, Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He was just at our Enterprise Data World Conference in Boston. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles and 11 books. The most recent is Your Data Strategy. Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. For some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to Go take off uh, with this, today's webinar. Peter, hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon. And uh, first of all, thanks to Cam and Dipti for, for setting us up for this. And as I said, we do have some interlocking teams that we're going to talk to you all about today. Uh, just a, a quick note, we've got people in SCAR, as I can tell from here, uh, north is Calgary, and I am in Bogota, Colombia. So uh, welcome, everybody. It is definitely not winter down here. What we're going to talk about today is uh, give you a better understanding of sort of the fundamentals around data management technologies. And the reason I'm so excited to have Dipti and Cam join in later on is because there's a wide variety of practices around this. Some of your organizations are absolutely ready for some very advanced technologies. Um, and Tanner, probably what we ought to do is look at breaking this thing in the future into two different sections. So we'll take a look at that. But and Peter, I know we're a little challenged with you. and. Uh, today, <laughs> but your audio is starting to break up a little bit. I don't know if it's where your phone is. That's right, it's here, it's in there. So it should shout it off, it goes back again, but uh, we should be good. I'll dial directly into AT&T. What we're going to do is talk about technology considerations in here for a bit, and then we'll talk about data technology architectures that are important. Very few, one in 10 organizations actually manages a data technology architecture. We'll dive into, of course, our good old friends, the case tools, the repositories, and something that's been relatively new recently, profiling and discovery tools. I say relatively, they've been on the scene for about 15 years as opposed to case tools that have been around for almost 50 years at this point. Uh, then we'll look specifically at some data quality engineering tools, a little bit on the data quality life cycle, and if we have some time, we'll get to some other technologies. We'll see how it goes, given all of these things that we've got to try and accomplish today. So to get started, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background Peter, on... I'm going to interrupt you again. We can barely hear you, understand you. You're coming in pretty pretty broken up. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. I'm tied directly in. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, Shannon. <laughs> I, can trust I don't know if you can move your phone, if it's a reception issue, if you're on a cell phone I'm, or... I'm, not cell phone, sitting right here by the side. Let me try to secure the audio on the other uh, on this. I hate to do this because... Yeah. Yes, and, and yeah, he always talks fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's uh, switch. Sorry, guys. Hey, of course, no, you know, no. it was when he was uh, in the sound check, and now it's a little choppy. Mm -hmm. yeah, he I, I think we're just going to have to press on, Shannon. Here. I, 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 are you getting me at this point? Uh, kind of. Kind of. Well, that's not a good answer. Thank you for that. Uh, how do I switch it back over to the computer part of this thing? We have a better internet connection than we have an audio connection. Yeah, yeah. So where do I switch this? Where do I switch the video? Uh, there we go, audio connection. Hang on. And um, switch audio. All right, let's see. Can you guys? There, it switched.
Okay, are you there? Can you hear me now? A little better. It's at least clear. There's no choppiness. Maybe turn. Can you just like get yeah, right yeah. up in the mic? You're 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 low. Shannon, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Hello, hello. You just. Yeah. <laughs> one, two, three. There. Your your the sound is a lot better, but your your volume is low. Yeah, so we just need to turn up your audio. Uh, we can turn up the volume here. You still there? Sorry, guys. Thanks for your patience. We should do a webinar on the challenges of technology. <laughs> Shannon, can you hear me now? Yes. Shannon, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. I redialed in. Not sure what that was all about, but we'll give it a try. Anyway, back to where we were. Sorry about the interruption, guys. Okay. So you just need to share your screen again. No, there we go. Details, details, yeah. right? Details, yeah. <laughs> That's why Shannon's so important to these events. <laughs> all right. And we're back. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so what we see happening in most cases when organizations are just moving to the cloud, just to take one example, is that you get this idea that most people say it's a technology project and we're going to put all of our data in the cloud. I, I've been to a lot of organizations in the past five years where they say we're going to do this. The problem is when you forklift your data into the cloud, there's no basis for making decisions about what data that you have and what data that isn't. And Cam said already, he said 1% of your data is about 90% of your functionality. I like to do sort of an 80-20 rule on it, but the only argument I get is that it's more towards Cam's end of the argument than it is my end of the argument. Similarly, when you move your data to the cloud, you get no inclusion of architecture or engineering concepts in this. And there's no idea that these concepts are even missing from the process. Uh, there's my little thing there, 80% of organizational data is redundant, obsolete, or, tri or trivial. And so we just don't need to move it into the cloud at all unless you just want to enrich the cloud vendors. And don't get us wrong, cloud vendors do a great job on what they do. And so really what you should look at in terms of transforming the cloud is looking at less data. The data that's in there should be cleaner and it should be more shareable by definition, which means overall you need less of it all the way around. Now these are a couple of strategic planning assumptions that Gartner put out in December. By 2021, data strategy using hubs, lakes, and warehouses will support more use cases than things that don't produce more um, use cases in there than taking any one of those strategies independently. Similarly, by 2022, Gartner said 50% of cloud decisions will be based on the assets that are provided rather than on the product capability. So they see emerging of all these technologies going around here. And using active metadata will reduce the time to data delivery by 30%, which is something we'd all like to get to. Finally, the last prediction from Gartner was by 2023, AI-based automation will reduce the need for IT specialists by 20%. It's the first time I've ever heard anybody come up and tell me we need less data people uh, in this world, but I, I'm pretty sure they're wrong about this one. So the problem is, if you're looking at cloud offerings, you're going to stop looking at what the cloud does. Instead, look at what the cloud gives you access to. Again, an easy one is if you need access to YouTube data, then Google is probably a better cloud offering than Azure. Uh, on the other hand, if you're real important, uh, focus in on LinkedIn data or your Office 365 data, then Azure is going to be your better piece on that. And, and this is a picture from the Gartner report. Uh, again, it's out there at Gartner. You can get a hold of it. There's a URL down there. But what this really gets to is that we really don't have a good definition of data management all the way around. They sort of look at it as collect to connect. Uh, we've always looked at it as what happens between the sources and uses of data. And the idea is that once you start specializing in there, you'll have some data engineering, some storage, and some data delivery capabilities along with your data governance pieces in there. And that means you need to have specialized team skills, and that applies to the technology component as well. But even this diagram here, as, as much as we like it, is insufficient in my um, opinion on this because it doesn't well reflect the idea that data is something that we want to reuse in this case as opposed to simply deliver. So I'd like to talk about making a better data sandwich in this context. And the data sandwich really is composed of three parts. There's a matter of data literacy among your 
folks that you have working for it. You've got a data supply that's probably uneven and individual uses of standards, sometimes more than less. What we'd really like to do, of course, for all of these is to smooth them out and make them into a much more palatable sandwich. Now, this cannot happen without engineering and architecture. It simply does not work. And I was on a tea farm, interestingly enough, in India last summer, where I saw this little thing on a, 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 a little plaque behind the cash register. Quality, engineering, and architecture work products do not happen accidentally. And when we ask ourselves the question, why is there so much sand in our various technologies, our data sand, if you will, that isn't helping us get data delivery the way we'd like it to be, then we have some big, big problems. So technologies by themselves are a one-legged stool, and I can tell you that if United Airlines puts me on a stool to get me back from Bogota on Sunday to get to Newark uh, on a one-legged stool, I won't be comfortable. And we know now that three-legged stools are the minimum, minimum that you need to have in order to do this. Of course, the three legs are people, process, and technology in here, which should be interrelated as much as they possibly can, because only when you have them working together do you actually end up with good success. Let me give you a very quick example of this. We do an MDM uh, webinar around this. MDMs are a great set of technologies, but it's a discipline. And most of the time, we see this sold as a solution. And the problem with that is people think if they bought this silver bolt solution, it's going to solve the problems. It will if you also include the people and process pieces. So putting up an architecture like this is only going to be partially helpful to your actual solution. The technology first approaches de-emphasizing people and process components, and successful MDM requires governance and quality as well as understanding of your process architecture. Tools and methods are required in order to get this stuff to work. There's an enormous demand for data talent out there right now, and it is literally going through the roof. But our supply is not increasing, and this is a problem as well. I can give some numbers to this. In fact, there's a super study that showed that stored data is accumulating at 28% annual growth. I wish our retirement funds would accumulate at a 28% annual growth. But that the supply of data analysts in the workforce is only growing at 6%. These are the kinds of things that we need to have technology, and yet, what we see a lot of times is that people go off and buy technologies without understanding them. And again, that's why we're so happy to be working with the two vendors today and here that are going to tell us a little bit more after we get to the Q&A section about how they can help organizations do this. I mean, think again about Moore's Law. The hardest part of doing requirements is not doing design. So one of the goals, takeaways, if you will, is to, to postpone your technology investments as far as you possibly can, because that will allow you then to understand more about your requirements and then whether these various technologies actually come in to help them out. Think, too, in terms of your leadership, whether it's a CIO or a CDO at the top of your chain, they're feeling a lot of pressure to buy technologies. And if these individuals won't buy it, if they do listen to what we're talking about today and, and postpone their buying decisions until they really are ready to be a good customer in this, then they go around them and they go straight to the CEO or straight to the board. And it's just amazing to see the amount of pressure that these individuals are under. We also need to start doing a better job with what we call vendor or project promise auditing. So when somebody stands up and says, if you deliver this to me by Thursday, I'll get it an additional $50 million to the bottom line. Well, there are some organizations out there that are standing up and saying, and the last three promises that this individual who just stood up and made are in fact correct, because people don't really understand the hype curve. Now, a quick little bit on this. When considering a new subject, there is frequently a tendency to first overrate what we find to be already interesting and remarkable, and secondly, by a sort of natural reaction to undervalue the true state of the case. This was written between 1815 and 1852 by the world's first programmer, Lady Ada Augustus King. Sorry, Augusta King. I said that wrong. And this is her first program that she wrote. But she also then did something that Gartner turned into the hype cycle, and they've done a great job with it. The technology hype cycle starts with some sort of a technology trigger, rises to the peak of inflated expectations, drops to the trial of disillusionment, re jumps its way back up to the slope of enlightenment, and then onto the plateau of productivity. Now, the key is, to put this in the straight, ugly vernacular, wow, it's the best thing in the world. Oh, no, it really sucks. Well, the answer is it's somewhere in between. And it's going to be up to us to collectively figure this out. 
Here's a couple of examples in use. The hype cycle for data management as of July 2018, so the last one they've issued on this. Data as a service was at the top and about to fall to the bottom. So if you're in the data as a service business, you may want to think that or sit the next cycle out. If you're looking at information steward applications, things are about to get better for you. And master data management was actually at the trial of disillusionment at the very bottom of it now, which is why uh, we've seen that. Database platforms as a service, on the other hand, is a fairly mature organization. A couple of quick more, uh, information governance and master data. Again, machine learning is just on the ascending curve. We are just getting started with machine learning on this. Metadata management solutions, eh, falling off the top. And MDM of product and customer data, well, those are looking pretty mature. So, you should find these cycles as you're looking at technology. Gartner has them out there. They'd like you to pay for them, but I guarantee if you look hard enough, you'll be able to find them. One more quickly on this data storytelling is becoming important, as are chatbots. Uh, into this prescriptive analytics, however, is about to go over the oopsie at the very top. And if you're in text analytics, you're doing pretty well. So let's talk about what a data technology architecture is. And it's the idea that you need to have some sort of an organization. You need to understand how the technology works and what particular value it is going to supply in the context of your business requirements. So you can ask these questions to the vendors and you'll get a chance to at the end of this. What problem does this technology mean to solve? Who sets this technology apart from the others? Are there specific requirements that you need to have in order to run this? Do it have to be a certain type of shop? Or does this technology include security functionality? We all have seen um, little bits where people have left to do databases open on the web. So this data technology architecture is a part of the overall technology. It's considered part of the enterprise's data architecture and it addresses the questions, what technologies are standard, required, preferable, and acceptable? What technologies apply to purpose and circumstances? Which purposes and circumstances? And in a distributed environment, where should everything reside? Now, just so that you know the rest of this, presentation is largely organized for a takeaway. So Shannon will send out the slides at the end of this along with our, our, our sponsor slides as well. And you guys can take a look at this. So this is really thinking about what do we have in the presentation. You can come back and take a look at this later on, but I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of case tools. But guess what? The vast majority of our student population out there have never heard of case tools. This is appalling. We've stopped teaching case tools because case tools stopped being given away. The case tool market is alive and thriving, but it is amazing when you see a Microsoft executive stand up in a pro public meeting and say, oh my gosh, I've just discovered there are tools that help you do data modeling. This could be actually very valuable to us. I can't emphasize how important it is to make sure that your organization has an understanding of how case tools can play. And good case tools will play all the way from planning statements things that are your requirements to different components that hold all of this information together in one particular place and then actually create work products for you that you can produce out of it. In some cases, XML, in some cases, it's DDL that goes into your uh, databases and regenerates your database. All of these things are important. The always problematic drawback from this has been that when we ask people what are the main case tools they use, they cite three Microsoft products. Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint, and Microsoft Visio, none of which are, in fact, case tools. They are drawing tools, and of course, Excel has its own etymology as well. We've also seen an evolution. It used to be in the old days that ER Win and ER Studio were big players in the market, and Rational Ways then came along because they were giving it away to all the colleges and universities, so we tried to teach students about Rational Ways and how to do data modeling with it, which it can be done. It's not the easiest. Now, of course, both of those companies have been reborn as IDEA and PR Win. We have some very, very good product offerings on the market on this, and you will see these folks at the various uh, uh, forums that we have around here on this. Plus, of course, open source. And just remember that open source is never free. It needs its own care and feeding. And I've included in here for you a list of case tools that goes on for five pages. Uh, again, these are good things to have, but they are not something that most of your folks are familiar with if they graduated from good colleges and universities recently because we stopped teaching them about 20 years ago. And it is just absolutely appalling to me. Now, another problem with having case tools all the way around is that they cost per seat. So here's an old piece. Uh, some of these are going to look kind of old for you, but they haven't changed. This is really the key. They're still valid. If you have to spend thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars per seat, then you have to add this all up. And you can see it adds up to a fairly 
big investment. If I just want to ask for $2,500 a seat times 75 seats, that's about a two and a half million dollar investment by the time you add all of the workflow into it. Here is a case tool taxonomy that I adapted from a, a colleague's piece in here. And there are upper, middle, and lower case tools. And there are management tools. There are technical tools. There are support tools. There's a lot of things that are going on in this environment. But if you don't even know it exists in the first place, it's very hard to make sure it's useful in your organization. To finish up on case tools here, the real key is that the old way of doing it was that everything had to fit into a single case tool environment. There was limited access into and out of it. Uh, I worked on a project at the Defense Department, gosh, let's see, it was in the 90s, early 90s. We were going to create something called case tool definition interchange format. Uh, it's a precursor to XML and all of that. The new model that we're seeing here is now that you have some metadata and that you have more case tools as a service that can come in and do certain types of things for you in the organization and help you get essentially the service that you need to from them. For example, one case tool that I like a lot does a great clustering algorithm. And I haven't seen that duplicated in other tools, so I like to use that case tool for specifically the clustering algorithm. On the other hand, a better, excuse me, not a better, but a different case tool might actually give me a better layout of what the tool services, what the data model actually should look like on this. So our case tools are a big piece of this. Next one we're going to talk about is repositories. And Again, this is from that same Gardner report I referenced before. Just notice the two pieces in green. Identifying data that delivers value and supporting data governance and security are the huge, big poles in the tent here that everybody wants to pay attention to. Gartner says they did some measurements around this, and in measurements, they said that metadata occupies about 12% of the time that we spend doing data management. That's a nice number. I've never seen it before, and Gartner's pretty good with all this. But at the same time, Gartner will also come back and tell you that they view metadata repositories as an esoteric technology. Esoteric, in this case, being not directly related to the business. So that's a problem. And when we look over the repository environment, we tend to see an awful lot of organization surveys falling into this pattern. There's about 45% that really don't use anything at all. And that's sort of amazing. It does have a function to do with the size of the organization. Bigger organizations are starting to realize that they will gain efficiencies from using repository technologies. Uh, one in four, however, are building their own and doing just fine with it. Then there are the big players that play in this, and that typically is about a 16%. So you can see the market is quite fragmented given this. Now, I'm going to show you two. Uh, sort of quadrant charts that Gardner likes to produce here. This was 2004, and you, you see over here on the right, we're not really worried what was happening in 2004, other than to say some of the same players are still in the same quadrants as 2005. All of these documents are available from Gartner. You can contact them directly. They'd love to sign you for their subscription service for them, but nevertheless, you can still find people that have got access to them. So you see that Allen Systems group, that same leader in that quadrant, is playing in exactly the same space. Now, the main problem that we've had from the metadata repository perspective that's out there is simply this. In I think it was 91, IBM published something called the AD cycle information model. And this is literally how everything maps to everything else in an environment space. There is no business case in the world that will allow you to put your people to work doing this much mapping of metadata back and forth. However, knowing that this exists, and there are very good documents out there. There's a whole issue of the IBM Systems Journal, same journal that published John Zachman's original framework, that talk about how these things fit together. So this is not stuff you have to go back and reinvent. In fact, my colleague Michael Gorman uh, also has a meta uh, tool that he uses to track all of this stuff together. So my point is, if you have a metadata problem that you're working with, don't put your head to the wall and beat it. Talk to people. Ask around. Mike Coleman loves to talk to people. Uh, IBM would be happy to share some of those internal documents with you. Because a repository doesn't actually have to be an integrated solution. It has to be a solution that can easily be integratable. So find different words there. What I tell people is that 
we've been helping people for years and years. Instead of going out and buying six figures, seven figures worth of technology, they can implement metadata repository functionality for a very inexpensive piece. It usually takes a SQL Server uh, instance and a good SQL Server programmer and a good business case. The idea is it doesn't have to equal a repository, but it, if you create it correctly, and I've given you the academic basis for that in those two previous slides, it can be much easier to create something that will eventually evolve into a repository when you find out it does the entire prospect. Multiple repositories are not necessarily bad, and many people use Excel quite successfully to do this. It's not ideal, but if it gets the job done, that's good enough. The minimum functionality then is the ability to create, read, update, and delete, and evolve those various metadata items as we go through. And in order to manage metadata, you need metadata repository functionality in order to do this. So again, just a little bit there on repositories. The next category here, profiling and discovery tools, I, I will take a little bit of, of uh, pride and credit for inventing the field. When I was at the Defense Department in the late 80s, we discovered that we didn't have enough people to go in and do all of the work that was needed to do the Y2K remediation. Uh, Dave and I did a session on this at EDW. We had a lot of fun, and I think it was a very useful session as well. The, we put out a research proposal that said, can somebody come up with some algorithms that would help us analyze data better? And a wonderful PhD out of Cornell named Dina Bitten pulled together the first series of algorithms on this. And more importantly, what you see here on this chart is that, that governance, quality, and integration functionality that we need to have in here is well over half of what's going on in data management. So focusing in on that area turned out to be a really good idea. When we did this, we put it back out in the public sector, and you can see at the bottom of this slide, there was companies like Evoke and Metagenics and Essential that uh, came along and, and moved this maturity, uh, moved this technology forward in terms of the maturity. But the real key to it was that these data analysis technologies allowed a 10x improvement over the previous manual approaches. And the idea is that we're changing the way we used to do this. In the past, what we did is we came in and we sat down with a beamer, as we call them, and we'd put it on the desk and we'd put a blank screen of paper up and we'd say, tell us about your business. Now, this is a good way of doing this. I learned how to do this partly from Clive in, in many cases uh, on this. But switching to this new way, we can move to a semi-automated environment that is really engineered to be repository independent and you'll see that these tools are listed both in a separate category by themselves as well as in the category that includes data quality tools. Now, just to give you an idea of what this is, instead of in the old way, getting the business to tell us everything they knew about it and trying to make sure they were complete, we can do this analysis off time. We could select a pay code there. Uh, there's a pay code with an asterisk in there as a minimum value. And when we look at that, we could do a little bit of homework and say, hey, double click on that set of values. And you see that's what pops up in the window down on the bottom right hand of the screen. These actually show you the frequency distribution there. 50, uh, excuse me, 11.49% of the data that we're looking at in this sample is governed by this asterisk value. And then somebody says, 11%. Isn't about 11% of our workforce governed by the UK payment method? Aha. Uh -huh. So instead of asking the users to tell us about payment methods, we can go to them with a hypothesis. And we say, is it true that if you have an asterisk in that column, that means that your payment method is from the UK? People love to tell you yes or no. But more importantly, in addition to telling you yes or no, this changes the dynamics. When I was doing this full time for the Defense Department, we would spend three mornings a week. That would be eight till noon doing what we called model preparation. And the rest of the week, we did what we called a model refinement validation session. Those sessions went on and on with the users. And the most important thing was the business people wanted to know when they could have their good business people back. By the way, if they want to tell you that you can have people that you, they don't care about, they probably don't know enough to help you in this scenario as well. 
So with our new reactive, excuse me, proactive model, we can instead move this to just two afternoon sessions and spend most of the rest of the time doing investigation around the models. And that also gives us the ability then to figure out some measures around this. And this looks a little bit mathematically complex, but it just says you can't tell how long it's going to take or how much it's going to cost if you haven't ever done it before. And if you do it, keep track of it, you can set up an evolutionary process that will then move you towards the ability to predict with good certainty uh, that this is how long it's going to take and how, how much it's going to cost. By the way, I thought I had a brilliant business idea on this one, and I went to Wall Street and said, I can help you with mergers and acquisitions because I can tell you which ones are going to work and which ones aren't. And the answer I got was, get out of here. Uh, we don't want you to mess any merger deal up because once the deal goes through, we get our fees, and it doesn't matter. It's somebody else's problem at that point in time. A little disheartening, but that is part of the reality that we live in here. So I mentioned already that data profiling, you notice on the right-hand side, is also listed as a data quality tool. And before I dive into these tools, let me tell one more thing about profiling. If you have a proprietary database, a database that you do not understand what is going on in that database, this set of technologies can reverse engineer for you a logical third normal form of the model and tell you exactly what's going on there. So huge uses outside of just the quality, but if you don't look at quality at the same time, shame on you for not paying more attention to it. So again, I mentioned this before we were doing profiling on this. Here is the next tool that pops up. It's a parsing and standardization tool. And again, these are things that are starting now to appear as services. No problem with that. If you can feed a bunch of things in that look like phone numbers, and you could have it come back and tell you that here are the valid phone numbers that came out of your input phone numbers, that would be a service that I think a lot of people would pay some amount of money for, uh, certainly not millions in order to do that. Third category of tools, data transformations. So again, when you identify certain types of errors, and this is really where the machine learning is starting to dig in, we can identify automatically and say, oh, it looks like they're starting to write in their information that doesn't happen in the way. Now, this is a, a quick example here, but this is one that occurs oftentimes in master and reference data, where a lot of people will put down Great Britain as the country that is known as the United Kingdom. Uh, the problem is GB may not be your official standard definition for what that is. So a rule can pick that up and say, GB, did you mean really great Britain, or did you really want us to put in the proper way of doing that, which is the United Kingdom, UK, in order to do that? These transformation tools look through various patterns, come up with rule-based transformations, and allow the organization to end up with higher quality tools, uh, excuse me, data that is cleaned and organized better and faster in order to do that. Another set the class of tools is the data quality tools uh, that talk about identity resolution and matching. And the idea is, and you probably have this as well, if you've got people in your database and they've changed your email and you use email as a primary way of figuring out who the people are, when somebody changes the job, you move it. It's, it's why you hear that a database that is largely keyed on uh, email addresses is, oh, we've got a half-life of about uh, 90 days. Uh, or sometimes 180 days. It's definitely not a, a real useful way of doing this. But these identity matching tools are starting to do some very, very useful things, such as looking you up on the Internet. Uh, there's a great one we've used occasionally uh, called, I think it's HubSpot, and uh, they're a sort of CRM-ish tool. But if you start putting data into it, it'll go out on the Internet and find out what else it knows about Peter so that it can come back and say, is this the Peter that you're, in fact, talking about? Uh, in order to do this. Our fifth category of tools under the data quality tools are data enhancement tools. And these are pretty straightforward. These are things that we're going to add to the original data, such as the date and timestamp. If I knew something occurred, it's probably made more valuable to know when it occurred. Uh, we also can put in auditing information, contextual types of information. We can code them with geographics. And if you saw the Apple announcement from a couple of weeks ago, the new Apple credit card is, guess what, using some type of machine learning to go in and put in geographic information for which Starbucks you bought your coffee from uh, in order to do that. By the way, Capital One's had that technology around for years, but we're glad Apple's got it as well. Uh, again, demographic data, psychographic data that you can pull into this to pull all of these tools together. Last category of data quality tool 
technology under here are just the basics of reporting. And many, many organizations have been doing reporting for years. We had a joke on reporting in the old days because reporting was actually a report. It was a physical set of piece of paper back in the green screen terminal days. And when we put that report out, one of the things we would often ask is, I wonder if anybody's reading this. So the trick was, don't put out a report on a periodic basis and see if anybody complains. And if nobody was complaining, then it must have been the right decision. Now, that, that doesn't work anymore um, because now we have dashboards and so people now look at their dashboards and try to see things. Now, if you're not feeding the dashboard, you have a very different set of, of uh, problems that you have in your environment. So just good basic reporting is a wonderful way to do this. I, I've had some very interesting conversations with people who think they're in the data management profession because they're report writers. Um, they do a great job writing the reports, but if you don't fully understand everything that you're trying to do from the reporting perspective, it's a problem. One of my favorite examples was that I worked for uh, with a colleague on, on this one where we had two vice presidents that were both in a meeting telling the president of the bank that sales were simultaneously up and down. Their reports show that. That was absolutely correct, but obviously the data that underlaid that report was a problem. So again, just very briefly, let me go back through this a little bit. Let's get the right page there. Hang on. I just want to read the, read the tools here. There we go. Again, profiling tools, huge stuff. If you're just discovering profiling tools on this webinar, by all means, good for you, but get into there and, and find out. There's only been one book written on that subject, so it's a little bit hard to find some good information on. Uh, the book's written by Jack Olson, by the way. Um, Data parsing and standardization tools, data transformation tools, identity resolution and management, and enhancement tools, as well as good old reporting tools. So these are all critical pieces of data quality technologies that you have in order to put these up. And I want to say just a bit about the data quality lifecycle because it is kind of a problem. Originally, uh, our good friend Tom Redman put out in 1993 that this was the data quality life cycle. And it seemed reasonable enough at the time. You acquire data, you store it, and you use it. Makes sense. But it turns out it's a little bit more involved than just that. And this is because our profession, the data management profession, measures the amount of time it has been around in terms of decades. Whereas the accounting profession, another profession I'm very comfortable and understanding of, has been around for 8,000 years. In fact, this morning here in Bogota, we were shown a um, uh, a beer sale, I think it was from 14, 4, 450 BC, so 2,500 years old. Uh, I hopefully we'll get a, an artifact of that because that's kind of fun. And the reason this is important, again, is because if you just take the simplistic perspective here, you will miss out on the idea that the vendors actually can help you by putting in specific types of technologies that will help you with various aspects of the system life cycle development the data lifecycle development process. So again, we're not going to walk through all of these, just know that it does exist in reference form and that you can gain access to it when Shannon gives you the final set of tools on this. So we're going to finish up here in the last 10 minutes or so by looking at a couple of things that are a little bit further out and moving towards where our uh, sponsors are coming from as well. Uh, first of all, everybody wants to do data integration, and there's lots and lots of things that we can do that integrate data. The tools include servers, no big deal, we need a place to put the data. And there's something called enterprise information integration technologies. There are things called portals, and there are some conversion tools on this. We'll look at a couple of these to finish out on this. Portals were huge a couple of years ago. Again, it was the hype cycle. It was the greatest thing in the world, and then they were the worst thing in the world. The answer is, of course, they are in the middle somewhere. And this is a great piece I got from Terry Lyons back in 2001 that says, look, you can take your legacy systems and wrap them up into something that turns them into a portal. Like a better way to describe it is perhaps looking a little bit like this. And you can take web services take the old legacy application or just take the legacy code out of the old application and repackage it as a web service so that somebody in the organization can simply click a button here and look at regional reporting by state, by region, whatever it is that they're trying to get access to. These types of portals still have tremendous underutilized potential. And one of my favorites that I worked with was something called um, Top Tier 
which is a wonderful technology for wrapping up everything in your ERP, whether it matter whether it was SAP or PeopleSoft or, or uh, Oracle SAP, uh, excuse me, Oracle ERP. What you're doing here is you're essentially taking all of this information and wrapping it up in some way that's accessible. So instead of having to understand some of this information on here, which as you can see is pretty detailed, you could literally pick up a piece of information and drag it to something else. And what you're seeing here is that they've dragged the customer number here onto a master data stack that they have called customer. And that will then be interpreted as a request for additional information about the customer. Very, very useful types of technologies. We do not see enough organizations really investing in this, but it's a great way of trying to get to more self-serve type of activities around this. Portals also function very, very well as data quality tools. And I don't know that the portal itself will build any data quality into what you're doing, although you can do that. But you can use the portal just as you can use the cloud where we started about 50 minutes ago as a great place of entry. When you come in, put only data of known quality in the portal. Now, I'll tell a quick little story here. This is uh, uh, an executive at a company that had just been sold to a European organization. And he said, look, I got all these people coming into me with reports, and these reports tell me why I shouldn't sell their division, but all the other divisions should, should be sold. He said, the problem is I can't tell where they're getting the data. They have no provenance, they have no lineage around this. A portal can help with that process where you can say, only data, and this is of course the solution we developed for them, only data that's in that portal can be used to produce these reports. And if you want more data in the portal, make a good business case and show us how you're going to put data of known quality into that portal as opposed to data of unknown quality. Now, I won't ask the hundreds of you that are out there to raise your hand if you could make the statement, all of the data in our organization is of unknown quality, but you shouldn't sure want anybody else looking over our collective shoulders as we did something like that. Again, a couple of, again, integration pieces. EPL is extract, transform, and load. And this gives data to the new database, data warehouse, whatever it is we're talking about, with a very, very large uh, set of processes. People forget how much metadata can be mined from the ETL processes. It is a phenomenally useful space, and yet I'm just amazed that people just don't even think about it. In order for that job to run every night, it's got to be right, and whatever transformations it does has to be the right transformations, or else you've been working on something with a series of incorrect assumptions for a very long time. There's another category of these that are coming out, which is enterprise application integration that allows the applications to be connected. Again, these are wrappers and, and different packages that we put on them as well. And finally, there's a, a new category of EII, enterprise information integration, that allows tailored views to be delivered to the user at the time it's required. Here's an example of that. This is an older uh, product here, so I'm not endorsing anybody specifically, uh, but Metamatrix. And the only real tables that are in here, uh, in this case, are the ones that are in blue. So we take the two blue things on the far right and we do some sort of a transformation to them that get this this first orange table, the middle of the diagram at the very bottom. If we then say, ah, oh, and can we add to that a little bit more, again, the tagging information that I was talking about, the enhancement function here, I can now come up with this next orange table, which is a little bit smaller than the first orange table, at least in terms of metadata items. But now I need to find out the really last piece for my query, and that's going to require four other tables that I put together. For this one operation, I will end up with something that is useful, helpful to us as we look through all of these various bits and pieces. These are wonderful technologies, but I find fewer than one in ten organizations are really ready to start using them. So, Again, we've sort of flown very, very briefly here through data technology architecture, a little quick reminder of what case tools are, a little bit about repositories, more importantly, profiling and discovery tools, data quality engineering tools. Talked a little bit about the data life cycle just to show that we need to put some more time into it and a couple of esoteric things. I want to finish up here as we approach the top of the hour with a couple of quick uh, findings from Gartner here as well. The idea is that these Assets continue to provide strategic cloud service offerings. In other words, you're going to stop buying clouds based on whether it's Google, Microsoft, or Amazon, and instead you're going to look at clouds as what, if I buy into Google, can I get access to? 
you're seeing a huge, huge uh, sea of change that's coming out in machine learning. This is the idea that most of the knowledge on how to do those kind of tweaks and things that we do are tied up in people's heads. And what we really want to do is change that quite a bit and instead move it into somewhere where we can encode these things. And this is where machine learning can prove to be tremendously helpful in all of this. Although there's a huge debate about whether machine learning is part of data management or not, I certainly think it is. Again, these use of cloud applications get us the clouds in the database. And so we can start looking at what happens if we put the cloud, excuse me, the database in the cloud. Now, it's going to depend on your business need. Yes, it's a great idea to say, I'd really like to have no DBAs and have Amazon manage all that stuff for me. But that may not be in the best interest of the business. So do a good job of keeping track of what your requirements are, how important they are, what types of things you need to have, and what type of expertise you need to have in order to run your business. For example, those of you that are in the insurance industry, you understand inherently that you are in an information producing business. And probably the DBAs have some value in there that I wouldn't necessarily want to simply outsource without at least sucking all of that wonderful meta metadata out of their heads. Last point from Gartner on this slide is that they have a fairly obvious, I think, conclusion, but it's probably good for them to state it, that remember when data lakes were going to take over the world? Well, guess what? Gardner is now saying that if you have a combination of data warehouses, lakes, and hubs, you can achieve greater flexibility than if you have only one of the others. If you only have warehouses, only data lakes, or only hubs, you're going to not be able to survive and to provide as much uh, clarity around all of it. Now we're headed to our Q&A session. I'm going to just finish up here with a little bit of a, a bit narrative here and just sort of hopefully show you guys how this stuff actually all does fit together on this. So while you're thinking about your questions and things, let's just think for a minute here about how most organizations perceive data. And I don't mean this is the people on the call. The hundreds of you that are out there on this call really do understand that data is much more than the bat sign in between IT and business. And so many people say, great, so we'd like it to be here, right? There's IT, there's data, and the business. This is really one of the justifications for the whole CDO movement that we've seen. And interestingly enough, the federal government, most people are not aware of, has mandated the use of chief data officers throughout all federal agencies starting on July 14th, 2019. But here's the real state of things. Your organization and your IT group are swimming in a sea of data. And that sea of data is never going to get any less. And if we don't have automation technology, the kinds of things that our, our sponsors are going to be talking about here uh, in our Q&A session, in other words, then there's no chance that we're ever going to get a handle on all of the data. Uh, the other big thing that we see is that organizations are simply saying we want to go digital. We absolutely have to go digital, but you can't go data, you can go digital just by selling data. It does require additional work. And that is not something that we've seen a lot of organizations that want to get involved in. So when we look at this, it really comes down to we've got some bad data and we've got some wonderful, wonderful thing that happens in the middle of it, but we're still going to get bad results at the end of this. And I like to call this the Lady Ada Augusta King rule because it follows perfectly with our hype cycle. Yes, there are some things that some of the stuff we work really well on, but unfortunately the salespeople don't always know what they're talking about. Uh, again, present company completely accepted uh, from all of that. So one last piece of the comment on blockchain here, but it's still really, really relevant. Somebody posted this on LinkedIn as a recent technology realization. And the realization was, if I've got chocolate ice cream on this end, and I've got something awesome, I'm still going to get chocolate ice cream on the other end. And that this is true without blockchain, and it's true with blockchain. The fact that this is a recent technology realization says that we are not doing a good enough job educating our young people to the foibles that we are looking at in this environment. And this is simply something that all of us on the call that know this particular statement, garbage in and garbage out, is not going to change. Garbage in and garbage out is fine. We abbreviate it as GIGO. You'll hear that. We get garbage data and we've got a perfect model, but we still get bad results because we have garbage data. And that's true whether you have a data warehouse, machine learning, business intelligence, blockchain, AI, master data management, data governance, analytics, technology, whatever sort, 
it's going to be problematic if we don't get the data fixed. So our goal here is to replace that poor quality data with good quality data. And if we do that, the data will start to propagate into our various streams that we have here, and eventually we'll be able to get to good results on the other side of this. In this case, I call it quality in, quality out in order to get that one. We are right at the top of the hour, and it's time for us to turn back to Shannon and start the Q&A sessions on this. Shannon, back to you. Peter, thank you so much for this great presentation, as always. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for, to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording from these presentations today. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, you know, I was kind of answered later after this question was input, but let me just let me just ask it again, uh, Peter, just to see if you have any additional um, things you want to add to that, and if Canem did you want to add to that as well. What is it meant by active metadata reducing de data delivery time? Of course, one of the fun things about this whole industry is that it's really hard to tell what people mean when they say active metadata. So I did a little bit of research around that, and as best I can tell, and I'll turn it over to Cameron Diffie as well to see if they have anything else, it's the idea that you're using metadata as a tool. Now, let's just start for a minute here and realize that metadata is not a noun. Metadata is actually an adverb. It's a verb that's being used as a noun. So you technically metadata some data, but there is no such thing as metadata if you look around and point to it because that, data, that is data, metadata is data, and it should be managed using data management technologies. So the idea that most organizations get into is that they start looking around and pointing to things and say, is that metadata, is that metadata, is that metadata? If you instead take the approach that by understanding where metadata is and how data is used as metadata, then you can start to push it into these machine learning algorithms. And so that's the, the best I've come up with in doing a little bit of research around it. But let me ask Cam and Nipsey to see if they have anything. Cam, you want to go first? Active yeah, sure, absolutely. Not much more to add than what you've already added. I think active metadata is looking at how the, how the metadata is essentially being used in the organization. So when you think of things like data lineage, how the data is actually flowing through the organization, you can collect information about how that metadata is um, being managed and utilized. That seems to be some of the consensus on what is meant by active metadata. It certainly is one of the more emerging terms, though, that is being championed by Gartner and others. So expect to see, uh, hopefully, some broader consensus on the term in the future. Okay. Deputy, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, sure, Peter. Look. Let me just put you on the spot there to so tell us a little bit how the product that you're talking about actually incorporates those concepts into it. I think that is the place that you get to sell. Yeah, sure. So I, I think primarily um, what we're looking at is from a data cataloging and also from a data governance perspective, the use of metadata is incredibly important when looking at what data is going to be the most valuable and important for the business. So I think one of the key themes that you talked about, Peter, is you have to make sure that the technology and also the disciplines that you're incorporating really serve the business intent, the business value, and the business objectives that the individuals in the organization care about. So with the explosion of data, the metadata about what data assets you have in the organization, if we can get our hands around the active metadata on how that, that information is being used, where it's flowing in the organization, we can see what data is being fed into reports, what data is being used for enterprise KPIs and analytics that are important to leadership and to the executive team. We can see what data is a part of our core business processes, so whether it's creating new products, delivering new services, um, improving our quote to cash processes, things like that, or even just looking at what data is going to be important from a security and compliance perspective, the better that we can derive that metadata and specifically active metadata about what information we have, the better we can move the needle towards building our, our data management, data governance, data quality, all of the capabilities that you talked about, the better we can be at building those programs toward driving some specific value for the business. And so that's how we're thinking about leveraging metadata specifically in the, 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 the categories around data discovery, data governance, um, and data management um, in, in that particular way. Super, Tim. That, that would qualify as a surprise question because we definitely did not rehearse that one as far as that goes. So thanks for playing along. <laughs> How about you? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think metadata is a really important aspect of um, of big data management, right? As a whole, as more data gets generated, um, a large percentage of that might be dark data. And the only way to kind of differentiate between business critical uh, and then the rest of the data uh, many times is metadata. And metadata management is actually a very important part of big data systems in general and Aluxio specifically because um, we actually manage metadata uh, as a core uh, as a core uh, value and core innovation with uh, tiered metadata management um, because when you think about files and objects, um, the the binary bits is 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 the data, but actually the most valuable piece is the metadata about the files and objects. And so there's a, there's a lot of innovation in the product itself that helps with uh, metadata management, uh, particularly the temperature of the metadata in the way we we move data around, and uh, and also accessing um, data based on uh, based on the metadata. Uh, and pulling it back from the understores and the data silos uh, where data might be spread. And Dutty, you said two things in there that I think everybody else might be asking questions about. What do you mean by the temperature of the metadata? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, um, you know, when you think about uh, data, uh, you, you think about the value of data, right? And um, as more data gets generated, um, there is really a lot of data, but how do you know what data is most valuable? The way we think of it is if an application, uh, if an analytical application, or, or any app for that matter, is using data, that becomes active data, that becomes uh, hot data, uh, and you want to know uh, and you want to uh, manage your hot data and warm data um, in a better way than all your data because you want to you want to make it special in a way because that's your most important business critical data and if you manage your metadata in a way where you track usage and you track applications uh, the trends of these applications using the metadata and and you and you track it as a part of the metadata you understand the temperature of your data better which means that you might be able to understand the value of your data better which parts of your data set are most important versus the others which are less important and you can prioritize um, resources accordingly for that for that hot and warm data as well. That gets back to the thing Pam was saying too about one percent of your data may be influ influencing as much as 90 percent of your operations that are exactly. out there. Exactly. Uh, yeah well that, thank you both for both of those and, and let me just clarify too Gartner term dark data is the data in your organization that you don't know that you have or should be using. And so uh, another great term that, that uh, we don't get us wrong, we love Gartner, but uh, sometimes the terms are, are a little bit confusing in there. <laughs> Jen, other questions? Yeah, absolutely. I love this next question coming in. Uh, I think it's a great question for all three of you. Where do you see live data versus static data, real-time capture versus manual input become the majority and not the minority? So let me set the scene from our two colleagues and we'll let Dippy go first on this one. The, the key is it used to be the data there was always some sort of delay that got to you, whether it was a monthly delay. I remember I worked for a, a women's clothing store in my teens and we took all this wonderful data that came in that could tell us that t-shirts sold better at noon uh, than they did at, uh, you know, at dusk, right? Just simple things like that. And they would take all this data and they'd roll it into monthly statistics for us that were simply of absolutely no help whatsoever. So it was the opposite mm -hmm. of, of live data in, in that type of a context. Now, with some of the wonderful new technologies that we have, and, and again, not just these two vendors, but we're seeing our ability to get to things a lot faster. People have Blackberries, they have, you know, uh, uh, smartphones and things that can actually deliver these, uh, these, these bits of information to them in a way that can make a difference. Um, I'm currently managing a website right now, and, and when I get a sign up for that, that's what I call live data, I can go in right away and, and, and you know, do it if I'm waiting in line at the gas station. So you know, that's a very poor example. Diffie, let me go to you first and, and talk about how you guys see the real surge in live data and how that your product can help that. 
Yeah, I think that this has become a, a really important live data, streaming data over the last five years. As you mentioned, technology has caught up with uh, actually being able to use live data, right, as opposed to a month-old data or uh, even a day-old data. Uh, a great example that we see is in retail, uh, where um, online retail, e-commerce, internet companies, they want to have sales attribution, and they want to have sales attribution on, you know, what coupon or what, what uh, promotion is, uh, is working the best. And we're talking about a minute old, right? A minute old or a few, uh, of maybe even five minutes old, and they want to run sales attribution uh, online in real time uh, and, and reuse those coupons or reuse those promotions. And so you're talking about you know, real live data that, and you're making decisions about uh, what to promote in real time as well. So to be a truly you know, data-driven uh, product or, or company, you actually need to leverage live data, which, which might be the most valuable data as well as the most recent data uh, ends up being the most valuable in, in some cases, particularly retail and telecommunication, because you can use that immediately to create effect. And I think that's what we're seeing. Um, uh, and and Aluxio gets leveraged because uh, of the, the again, the, the temperature. You want to make sure that your most valuable data, uh, which might be the live data, uh, is uh, is treated uh, more um, in a special way and is brought closer to the, 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 uh, the compute environments. So that's kind of what we're seeing is um, uh, the, the world is moving towards live data is, is the data, right, is, is, what the, is what the most valuable data is. Um, and it, it depends on the use case. If, uh, in some cases, it, it can make real impact. In others, it may not. And so depending on the use case, you might want to prioritize live data. Super, Cam, anything to add to that? Yeah, I completely agree with, with Dippy on that. I mean, you really look at the time, the viability of how quickly do you need the data and what's the purpose that that information is going to be used for. So when you look at things like, this is the example that Dippy had, had given around real-time reporting, real-time use, you know, being able to get access to that live data is going to be critically important versus static, that might be information that would be used for more of a an example or a use case where the time can be set. Now, one of the examples around that is if you're using data to really run demand planning or something like that, maybe once a month, um, where you're going to look at uh, what, um, what information is needed to plan for products a couple of days in advance. That data um, perhaps might be able to be a little bit more static than it would be live. Essentially, the biggest component with that is with the, I think, the advent in the increasing capabilities of being able to get more data more quickly. Live data is becoming more important because people want results, people want information more quickly in general. But it certainly comes back around to the use case and what you're trying to achieve. And the use case ROI, of course, is part of that as well. I'm going to add one more piece to that, too. Both you guys gave some real good examples. One of the things you'll see happening more and more is a reference to A-B testing and how data is critical to this, data management in particular. Uh, I use MailChimp to manage my mailing list for things, and one of the things that MailChimp will do is set up two different versions of it, see which one gets the most hits, and then send the rest of them out that way. And it does it automatically. That's a real value add to me from a MailChimp perspective because I'm an idiot when it comes to online marketing. Uh, so there's a way that, that, that that can help out. But the other part of it is you'll see that all of your organizations are engaged in some form of A-B testing in this. And what we're talking about in live data is a shortening of the feedback loop. When I was selling women's clothing in Richmond and it was sweltering in August and the folks in Providence, Rhode Island with the company I was working for were trying to tell me to sell sweaters, it just didn't make any sense because of the lag that was involved in this. So I contend that live data or the liveness or the freshness of the data will actually become an attribute that we may start to manage in very interesting ways going forward on this. Anyway, great question, Shannon. Thanks for that and, and great answers for you guys. Thanks. Yes, thanks to the attendees. We've got so, much, so many great questions coming in. If you have a question, feel free to submit it in the bottom right-hand corner of the Q&A. We'll try to get as many as possible in here. Um, so, guys, people, process, and technology, where does the data fit? Is it the seat of the three-legged tool? Uh, great question. I don't know that I've got an answer to that, although I know from Shannon's uh, little probing that we need to move quickly on it, so I'm just going to turn that one over to you guys. Any, any idea where does data fit in this particular slide? 
that it's a seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, I, I, I can jump in. You know, we, we were actually, um, I was talking with, with a customer the other day, and I, I put it to them in an analogy that was somewhat like this. Imagine that we're all cooking a meal, and the meal is essentially the result that we want our data to deliver. So you go into a restaurant, and whether, you know, think about your favorite meal or thinking of the, think about a piece of cake that you want. Really, the recipe that the chefs follow in the back to deliver you that meal, that's the process. So that is the codified process, the best way to cook that meal, um, a way that's been proven and the, the, that's gonna deliver you the, the best result. The tools, well, there are many things in the kitchen that can be, be the tools. We can grill a steak over a grill. We can cook a steak on the oven. We can, we can, um, we can uh, uh, sear it on the, the top of a range. So that really gets back to the tools that you use need to really be used to deliver that meal in the way that your stakeholders and your personas, so to speak, that you want to deliver that meal for in the organization in the way that they expect it. And that can be used as an analogy for reporting. Um, that can be used as an analogy for compliance and regulatory events where, where that data has to be prepared in a certain way. The people, that of course gets down to the chef. I think no further explanation there. The data, what's the data? The data is the ingredients. So the data are the ingredients, all the things that you have in the back freezer, the back refrigerator that you could pull from to cook your meal. Now, some ingredients you might not need. In fact, there are probably just a couple of ingredients that you need to cook the, the meal that your stakeholders ultimately require. In order to cook that meal, you have to follow the process and you have to use the right tools. So I'm not sure if I exactly answered your question, but hopefully just through the magic of analogy, maybe that makes a little bit more sense on how data is used across people, process, and technology. And then we'll turn it back over to our wonderful audience out there because one of the reasons we do this is because we're looking for you guys to actively improve this. We've used this people, process, and technology stool for a long time. I like to say that the stool is made of good data, but that's not very helpful. So there's probably a better analogy, and one of you guys will probably come up with it. So let's 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 challenge everybody. Dipti, any anything you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, I think um, you know you can think about it as an ingredient in one way. Um, in another way, you can think about data as a part of all three uh, legs of the stool. And and the and and the way to think about it is uh, people from a people perspective. If you, you need a data-driven culture, right? If you have a culture that's data-driven where, um, where you make decisions based on data, not just uh, anecdotes or not just you know, uh, subjective kind of uh, information, uh, that's really the people aspect is uh, people uh, and uh, talent that you have in your organization needs to, needs to think from a data-driven perspective. The process needs to be data driven as well, right? And then the technology, obviously, um, you have to have the right data technology to solve the right problem, uh, and that becomes, uh, you know, the the method or the the implementation detail. But if you don't have the the, the data driven culture uh, with your teams, and you don't have a data driven process, even having the best technology and the best data. Uh, management technology or metadata management or cloud management is not going to help unless you have the first two in place. And so that's the way I think about it is it's actually spread across all these three aspects. Super. Thanks, Tati. Jen, next question. Yes, yeah, so how does one do the quote-unquote new way of getting to know the data landscape if no longer the old way of, quote, tell me about your business, unquote? <laughs> so back to the profiling piece. And then I think the question was, what is the difference? What allows us to get that order of magnitude improvement in productivity? If you've ever worked in a context where you're trying to get information out of folks that have this information, but you need to formalize it, and then again, this is putting the beamer down on the desk and, and starting to talk about it in this fashion. If I've always got to have people involved, it gets us to something we call the terror of the blank screen, and your screens didn't go blank, I did that, and I'll bring it right back again there. Um, people just don't like to create, but everybody likes to edit. And so by letting people know and that they get cookies, uh, real cookies, not you know electronic cookies, uh, uh, for, for answering these questions and, and for proving this type of information correct, it leads to a much more rapid 
development environment. Uh, somebody was telling me this morning, it, in some ways it resembles a lot of some of the agile techniques that we're seeing in the sense that it's an iterative approach and that we have the right people in the room to actually do this. But the role in the room is to confirm or deny the hypotheses that we have. So we may say, X is connected to Y via this type of relationship. And if they say, no, that's not right, we say, great, thank you. You've helped improve our model. Because as far as we could tell, that was the best we were able to come up with. I think that answers it, but hopefully we'll get some live data feedback on it, right? <laughs> Any additional comments to that, Cam or Dipti? It, no, this is Cam, not on my end. I, nothing more to add to, than what Peter already has. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah, same here. And it, it's interesting how this ties into the 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 three legs, right? The data driven and uh, aspect of people, process, and technology. Thanks, Jesse. Perfect. And so, you know, this came up in the chat. One of the things that, that you know, we we love about this, uh, our webinar community, is the chat's always just on fire. And this came up in the chat, um, and it comes up in almost every webinar that we do, no matter who the speaker is. And especially with two new speakers on, um, I wanted to bring this up because we do, like I say, we get this question all the time, so I'd love some fresh perspectives. So, you know, we, as, you know, a lot of, um, we all, on the line spend time educating on you know data management and the value of it and and so on and so forth and the various aspects of it but how do you actually get people to listen how do you get and, and to further expand that you know how do you get executive sign off on um, on these necessary pieces to data management so yeah, great question and, and uh, I've, I've talked to a lot of folks about elevator speeches uh, where it's really really critical to make sure that you've got everybody on the team that can answer a question in a certain way with a consistent message because that's the way it works but now what we're starting to see is a formal discipline around data storytelling starting to evolve notice it's at the beginning of the hype cycle which means it's going to go up to the top and then it's going to crash just like everything else is. but somewhere down the line we will have more guidance around this and this is something that uh, we see a lot of classes that are being offered in universities now called data journalism, where they're given a data set and told to write stories out of it. If you want to get people in the corner office to pay attention, you have to translate this stuff into something that matters to them. Usually that's dollars. Sometimes it's, it's, it's um, lives and, and, and you know, experience and, and things of a, a critical nature in terms of things, but it's got to matter to the people in the corner offices, or they're just going to look at you as a technology person and not think that you have anything useful that you are going to be able to add to that. Again, I'll turn it over to my colleagues here and see if they want to enhance that. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Peter, that you know data storytelling is, uh, is so important. Uh, an, an analogy, a similar analogy is uh, in the startup world, um, you know, if you have a great technology, it's not going to sell by itself, right? You need to kind of see a real market and a real value. It's the same thing with data. Uh, it might be, there might be a ton of data, it might be great data, but unless you see real value from that data and you see returns and, and an ROI, um, the, the, other, uh, the, the person on the other end is not going to understand the value of the data. And so at the end of the day, all these uh, data-driven um, exercises and processes and technologies are uh, meant to get value out of the data. And, that's, and, and telling that story of what value it creates is the important bit. And so as you put together an architecture to um, get more insights and value from your data, uh, it's important to kind of uh, uh, have that storytelling be a part of it as well, because otherwise you're not going to be able to convince the other end of the line or the executives uh, on the importance of data or the importance of that process or the importance of that technology. And so at the end of the day, that storytelling is uh, is going to be very important. Super I completely yeah, agree with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. You know, this is something that, that comes up quite a bit um, and, and something that, that seems to always be a question that's asked usually more often than not around data governance in terms of being the, the biggest, the, the, the 
the place where we see the highest obstacle because data governance has almost been vilified and, and been turned into a, a four letter word. It means that you're not allowing me to do something. Whereas something like data quality or around analytics or around AI, machine learning, you know, all various other aspects that pertain to data tend to be a little bit more exciting. If you can communicate the value and the significance and, and really the importance of data governance, you can almost communicate the importance of anything. And there are, there are a couple of things that, that we think about. First of all, I'll, I will absolutely echo what Peter and, and Dipti had already said. Finding a way to um, uh, understand what your, uh, what your audience and what your stakeholders care about and then linking your story to that instead of trying to, to get, um, get them uh, to care about what you already care about, that is extremely important. So think about what is it that already has your audience bought in. As an, exa uh, um, as an example, if you're talking to someone within supply chain, they're going to care around uh, about on-time delivery. They're going to care about um, supplier fulfillment. They're going to care about uh, day sales uh, outstanding. If you're talking to a CFO, they are going to care about serving Zoxley. They're going to care about hard financial numbers. If you're talking to someone in marketing, they're going to care about prospecting and campaigns. Think about how data really drives the, the things that they care about and put it into that story, put it into that framework. The second thing is, is there are multiple different uh, kinds of value. So there's not just hard monetary forms of value, and you, you can certainly communicate your story that way. But there are also um, stories of value around how it, it can increase the performance, how it can increase speed, how it can increase competitive positioning for the organization, how it can just make life easier on them if, it, if it's a, a tactical problem on just being able to find the right information. So again, find what it is that is a pain point for them or something that they're already really passionate about and fit your story into that instead of trying to get them to buy into why they should care about data quality or data governance or master data management or something that you are trying to champion. That would, that would probably be the best advice that, that I can give. There's a lot more content that we have on that. So if anyone's interested in additional information there, you can reach out to us after this session. And I don't think either of you guys would say this stuff is easy. <laughs> no, not at all. It's, it's probably, I, I would say it's, it's one of the hardest aspects in building a successful program because people will change, people will move on and up in the organization, and the intent of the business will change. This year, the business will care about X, Y, and Z. Next year, it'll be about A, B, and C. So you constantly need to find ways to reinvent your story and make sure that you're linking it to whatever mm -hmm. those important objectives are. Yep, agreed. All right, well, I think we have time to one last question one here. Yep. So back to the um, your stool metaphor, um, Peter. You know, what would your where would you place rules? Would that be the fourth leg? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, the, the stool may not be the best metaphor. <laughs> I'm going to push back and tell you guys, help us come up with some better ways of describing this. So the question is, where would the rules fit into this? Um, I think that most people would say that rules inherently go under process. But I don't know that my colleagues would agree with me there. Cam, Dipti, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think process is a good place to uh, kind of add um, uh, add checks in, right? As a part of the the flow, um, as you're kind of coming up with the the end to end flow of um, uh, the the entire data management process. Uh, rules come up in many different phases, and each phase needs um, checks and boundaries in terms of, you know, what goes in, what comes out, and uh, is it, you know, is it aligned with, uh, with that, that specific phase. So I would, I would think that rules uh, kind of fall in, uh, into the process leg, uh, and, um, uh, and, and it depends on, you know, uh, for some processes like governance, for example, or uh, metadata management uh, becomes really important that they are in place. Um, otherwise, you could uh, it, it could get a little bit chaotic. Cam? Yeah, I, I would agree. It, it, sure, it, and I think you know with it, with this picture, you could add an infinite number of legs to the stool. You know, other variations that I think we've we've seen in the past have been people, process, policies, and technology, or people, process, procedures. 
in technologies. Mm -hmm. I think pe you know people don't want to to break the P um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, alliteration there, but certainly you could you could go as far as say people process rules in in technology or the policies there. Um, so yeah, it's it it really I think comes back to what is going to resonate with um, the individuals that you're trying to communicate with and being able to see rules and policies and where does that make up the, the overall framework, if that's important, then absolutely I would support including that. I don't recall it technology. We could, we'll steal a, a thing out of Gardner's book and make up our own, our own term for it. There you go. Well, listen, guys, it's just been super conversing with you. And of course, everybody's questions are simulating as always. Shannon, we'll turn it back to you for some final thoughts. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, Peter, for another great presentation. And Cam and Dipti, thank you so much for joining us and, and adding to the uh, conversation here, as Peter mentioned. And of course, thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the conversation going on. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording for everybody. And again, thanks to Alexio and to Infogix for sponsoring to enable help make all these webinars happen. As you can see, Peter is displaying next month's webinar, Data Management Maturity, another great presentation there on uh, the Data Management Maturity model. So hope you all can join us next month. Thank you so much, and thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.